Welcome to Healthy Minds. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein. Everyone is touched by psychiatric conditions, either themselves or a loved one. Do not suffer in silence. With help, there is hope. Today on Healthy Minds. Somebody at the back of the room got up and they said, you know, Dr. Insel, you just don't get it. And I was a little taken aback. I thought, I've been doing this for a while. I thought, I get it pretty well, I thought. And she said, no, 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 you, you, you are, you're missing the point. She said, I have a son who's 23, year, 23 years old with schizophrenia, who's homeless. Our house is on fire, and you're talking about the chemistry of the paint. And that got me thinking. We're a few years behind Uber and Airbnb and even Facebook, um, but it's not to say that that kind of a model couldn't work for a lot of people with mental health issues. That's today on Healthy Minds. Healthy Minds is brought to you in part by the American Psychiatric Association Foundation, the Graham Beck Foundation, and the New York State Office of Mental Health. Welcome to Healthy Minds. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein. Can technology, including social media, become a new force in improving mental health? Today I speak with Dr. Tom Insull, former director of the National Institute of Mental Health, who has moved to the private sector aiming to develop technologies to diagnose and treat mental illness. Tom, after serving for 13 years as the director of the National Institute of Mental Health, you've moved to private industry, and I'd like to ask you what, what made you make that change? Uh, the, the move, any of these moves, it, it are always a matter of um, head and heart. Uh, the head said, hey, you know, I've been here for 13 years. Much of what I came to do, I have done, uh, and it's time to look for the next challenge. Uh, the heart actually was spurred by a comment I heard. I was giving a public lecture at, um, I think it was an event on the West Coast, of maybe three, four years ago, and I was talking about all the fantastic science that NIMH had been supporting, uh, work on genetics and imaging and epigenetics and really getting at some of the most uh, elegant research that could be done linking brain and behavior and trying to relate that to mental illness. Somebody at the back of the room got up and they said, you know, Dr. Insel, you just don't get it. And I was a little taken aback. I thought, I've been doing this for a while. I thought, I get it pretty well, I thought. And she said, no, 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 you, you, you are, you're missing the point. She said, I have a son who's 23, year, 23 years old with schizophrenia, who's homeless. Our house is on fire and you're talking about the chemistry of the paint. And that got me thinking that actually, that was a pretty important point, that much of what we had been working on at NIMH was elegant and exciting and important, but it was gonna help people in 10 years, 15 years, maybe 20 years. What about now? And I needed to have something that would start to put out that fire. And having been in the same job for over a decade, it was time to go someplace where maybe the impact will be a little more proximal, or we could do something that might have a change in a year, or two years, or three, and not having to wait 10, 15, to 20 to see the impact. So as you've moved into this position, what's the direction that you're looking at? What do you see as having promised to have that kind of impact? Private sector is really different in a lot of ways, and I loved being a public servant, uh, but private sector is about products. You have to build something, and uh, there was a health team that was created and about a year and a half ago, or a little less, I joined to create a mental health team. And what we thought we'd do initially is just try to understand this question. How will technology be able to bend the curve? How could we start to put out that fire? What would it take? Uh, where would we want to focus that? Because there are, there's such a list of problems. If you start to ask yourself, why haven't we done better in terms of morbidity and mortality for people with serious mental illness? There's a pretty long list of answers to that question, and we're not gonna be able to take on all of them at once. 
we decided as a place to start that we should try to find a way to get better measurements. That one of the things that we began to realize as a, I think as a barrier to progress has been that clinicians in general don't measure what they do. Uh, and um, the idea of having measurement-based care, which is kind of integral to every part of medicine, somehow has been neglected in um, the treatment of people with mental illness. So could we do better? Now, some of that could be, yes, have people fill out rating forms. That's interesting, and it's important to get those subjective reports. But what if we could develop much more objective measures of behavior, maybe measures that would be continuous and highly accurate, and they could even be passive, something on your smartphone. Everybody, almost everybody, has a smartphone these days. Those phones are loaded with sensors. Is there information coming from those sensors that could tell you about sleep, activity, your social network? Uh, where are you going all day? Are you staying in bed all day? All those kinds of things which we don't actually track. And so what we do when we ask people how they're feeling or how they're, how they're coping is we see them once a week, maybe once a month, and um, maybe we fill out at most a rating form that has nine items on it that give you a sense of how they're doing at that moment in time. What we really want to know is how, how's it going for somebody in their worst moments and their best moments. In some ways what you're describing is a biomarker and we in the field always think of a biomarker looking at a blood test or a brain scan. You're talking about a way of monitoring a person's activities and behaviors that could help us diagnose and better treat people. You got it. It is, in a sense, a biomarker, although it's not bio. We call it digital phenotyping. So it's a chance to capture someone's behavior, their mood, their cognition, a, a fuller picture of how somebody's doing that they want to share. So they consent to this. They tell us what they want us to be able to look at. Uh, and then it's an opportunity for them to get a picture of how they're doing. If they've started on medication for depression, is it having an impact? You know, one of the things you see when people are severely depressed, as they get better, they're often the last ones to know. You'll hear this from um, the wife or the parent or maybe somebody who they work with. They're saying, gosh, you know, they're doing so much better. You ask the patient and he or she says, no, I'm not feeling any better yet. Would it be helpful to have those kinds of objective measures there? And it is essentially like a biomarker in the sense that it's objective, it's quantifiable, allows you to track over time, and it could be free. So these are the kinds of things we've begun to think about. I think it's a start. And the hope is that we can use that when we have better measurement. We can use that to, then to build really a whole program around um, what we call tech-enabled care, giving people better care, care that's continuous, care that's of high quality, care that's coordinated so that it brings together all the things that we know about today that can be helpful, but we're not doing a very good job to deliver those things. So just like now, if we're treating somebody's high blood pressure, we monitor their blood pressure, and when it gets down to the level it needs to be, we know we've succeeded by monitoring these types of activities that may be associated with depression, we would be better able to know, okay, we're where we need to get to for this person in terms of treatment or not. A lot of this, of course, depends on someone's ex subjective experience. No question, that's extremely important. You don't want to throw that out. And it's important to capture that as well, but also to capture that continually, not once a week, but to actually know how people are doing uh, throughout their week. And so that we have a much fuller picture of someone's life experience. I think that's something that psychiatry used to think about much better 40 or 50 years ago. In fact, if I have a regret about my years at NIMH, it's that we probably spent way too much on trying to get at the genetics and the circuits and the cells that are involved. We didn't really keep our eye on behavior as a very complicated and tractable area for trying to help people. It's partly because I think we didn't realize yet that we had tools to do this in a way that was revolutionary. We knew we had tools for genetics and imaging that were revolutionary. It's only recently that we've begun to realize, wow, we have the same kind of an approach that can capture enormous amounts of data about someone's behavior and make it useful and make it helpful. That's really, I think, 
to me, almost a revolution in the way we can approach this. It, it really is, if you think about where we were in terms of technology, even when you started at NIMH, people weren't walking around with smartphones in their pocket. Yeah, remember the smart re smartphone revolution really took place with the iPhone, which emerged in 2007. And you spoke about in private industry the need to develop products. Are there any products that are in place or that you see coming in place that a person, let's say with depression, might be able to use? If you look at this whole space of what we've got in terms of online services for mental health care, depression being a great example, um, yes, it is huge, but it's easy to sort of break it down to me. There, there's a group of products that are mostly around what I just call digital phenotyping, this idea that we can measure what we do better. There's a group of products for treatment, cognitive behavior therapy, dialectical behavior therapy. You can go down the list of all the CBT, DBT, IPT, all these different therapies, uh, along with coaching, along with peer support, which is very powerful and now available, uh, and even crisis intervention. All of those I'll put under the interventions umbrella and that's a group of now thousands of apps, some of which are better than others, some of which have good research behind them to show that they're effective. Uh, some have really good privacy, some have both. It's important for consumers to really take a look at those questions. What's the evidence that this is helpful? Who's it helpful for? And will my personal information be protected? Important questions to ask when you're looking at any of these. And finally, there's another group that actually isn't so much about direct interventions, but it's about coordinating care and linking to electronic health records. It's really more for, for payers and providers, uh, a set of tools that's helping them to deliver much more efficient care. There's a lot more to do in that space, but these three buckets, we'll call them, the ones that do with, deal with measurement or digital phenotyping, the ones that deal with interventions and those that really deal with the care experience and care coordination are probably the most exciting advances that we've seen online, most of them in the last five years. The real task now is to bring these all together, uh, not to create another app, but to create an ecosystem where any individual or any family would have access to the whole suite of things that seem to be useful. And at the same time, allow that ecosystem to become a learning system so that it gets better and better as more people use it. And coordinate this with the doctor or other provider of care so that people are really having that communication, sharing that information in a useful way. Two things have surprised me uh, in this quest, and we're still early on. I mean, I think the whole field is early on. There's a lot to, a lot to be done here. The first realization was in talking to providers, and what I heard was, don't give us more data. We are overwhelmed with information and we're, we're already concerned we don't have enough time to deal with the information that comes in. Help us be more efficient, help us with decision support, help us do our jobs better. So they weren't really looking for lots of data that we were collecting and we took that quite seriously. The second thing that I think has surprised me the most about this whole field um, and it maybe shouldn't have surprised me so much, but things are happening without the provider community being involved in the same way that Uber didn't go out and buy a lot of cars and Airbnb didn't buy any hotels. What you're seeing is uh, peer support growing up organically online, people helping each other, like Alcoholics Anonymous, like, you know, if you could imagine AA online, where communities are coming together with depression, with psychosis, with PTSD, with a range of different issues. People perhaps of similar experience, similar demographics, finding each other and supporting each other in really interesting ways. Coaches now becoming part of that. Some of these are linking to psychotherapy online. But you're getting um, very large platforms, a little bit in the way that Facebook developed, quite from bottom up you get this extraordinary uh, opportunity where people realize that you don't need bricks and mortar anymore. Maybe you don't even need the paternalistic care system that we've all grown up in. Um, and maybe like AA, there's a lot that can be done to get people not only to get help online, but to give help online, which is very empowering, very engaging. 
And that seems to be something that is that's taking off. I, so I, I don't know where we're going here. It's a very interesting time. Um, we're a few years behind Uber and Airbnb and even Facebook, um, but it's not to say that that kind of a model couldn't work for a lot of people with mental health issues. That making use of technology to sort of bring that sense of community amongst people who may have depression or schizophrenia or bipolar disorder to really help each other in addition to other professional help they receive. That's right. And I went into this thinking that, I must say, I went into this thinking that technology was the problem, not the solution. So I've been quite skeptical about how, how the internet's going to help because my sense was that a lot of people are becoming more isolated from each other rather than connecting. But, you know, I've had to take a close look at this. And my other strong belief was that these are serious problems that need serious solutions and that that means they have to be in our healthcare system. It's not totally clear that that's the case anymore. I think you're finding increasingly that people are getting help and giving help without some physician or without a clinic or even an insurance company getting engaged. It's free, ubiquitous, on demand. What's not to like here? We can't have such a picture of quality in that situation. We don't know how good the care is often, but it's clear that people are staying with this and they're staying because they're getting something of value. It's also clear that they're not staying with clinics very often and that there's often more engagement online than there is engagement with the healthcare, mental health care system that we've built and funded. I think we have to pay attention to that and ask ourselves in 2020, 2025, 2030, what will the suite of care look like? Is it really going to look like more of what we have today or is it going to be something very much more in the Uber, Airbnb, uh, Facebook kind of mode? People can get help at home through a very user-friendly interaction. Why not? At least as a part of what helps them. Yeah. Yeah, the terms we're hearing most often is on demand. I want this when I want it. Agency, I want to be in control of that schedule. And uh, anonymity, I don't really want people to know that I'm getting care. And the internet provides all three of those. Not a, not a bad solution. One of the areas I know you've been very interested in, dating back to your time at NIMH, um, has to do with early psychosis and early intervention in psychosis. And the problem that uh, for many, many people, uh, they don't begin treatment till well after a year after their symptoms start. And I'm curious if you see any of the technologies being able to help with that. Exactly. This is a really, uh, I think, a great opportunity. Uh, we call it moving upstream. And the concern we have that is that in psychiatry generally, when we see people in our care system, which is often the emergency room, it might be coming out of a, a criminal justice experience with someone who's arrested, uh, or it could be coming from a primary care doc. But any of those on-ramps usually take place in what I would call stage four. It would be the same as seeing people at a late stage of cancer when there's already metastasis. Uh, and in our case, we see people when they're in crisis and they're already disabled. Uh, to be honest, we don't do that well in cancer treatment if we wait till stage four. And so we shouldn't be so surprised that the numbers don't reflect a lot of success in psychiatry because we are getting there late. The hope is that maybe with technology, with the fact that you can capture people much earlier in this journey, you can, you can move upstream and get them at stage two or maybe even at stage one. Some of that is better education. Some of, the, of that, though, is, is really better access and giving people opportunities to get help before they're in crisis. Um, that's part of the just-in-time, on-demand kind of philosophy. You're there when they need you, not necessarily that they have to be where you are when you have an available appointment. I know that another area of importance and importance to you is suicide and suicide prevention. And I'm curious if you see any help in that area, again, using technology to help people who are at greater risk 
of hurting themselves. Well, suicide is incredibly important for uh, not just our field, but for society in general. You, you know, the public often doesn't understand that we have almost three times the number of suicides as homicides in this country. Um, the number is 44,000, the most recent CDC numbers. That's uh, way above the 17,000 homicides. And it's kind of extraordinary because the homicide number has actually fallen dramatically. The suicide number has trended up. And that's, that's a bit frustrating. That's not counting the 33,000 opiate overdoses that we had last year. So we're looking at a public health crisis for mortality. Remember, there are more suicides than there are breast cancer deaths. So the numbers are really profound and often not understood. So no question this is important. Can technology bend the curve here? I don't think we know that yet. We have some opportunities. There's been things like these suicide lifelines where people in crisis can call in. We now realize that for people under, the, under 25, uh, they do lots of things with their phones. Calling is not Using one of them. It, right, making a phone call is not on the list. I think it's number six. You know, it goes down way below texting, uh, taking photos, uh, searching maps, lots of other things. The crisis text line is a wonderful example of responding to that and providing a universal crisis number that anybody can text into uh, and have someone to talk to within, uh, I think it's about 30 seconds or something less than that. So there's somebody available at all times that they, not to talk to, to text to, and they get a, text, a texted response. Um, these are trained volunteers from around the country. There are thousands of them. Uh, and they have already um, responded to over 31 million texts. So this scales nicely. It does seem to be having an impact. It's not just for suicide, but it certainly is one of the avenues that I think it's going to be important. Technology will give us that just-in-time kind of crisis intervention response. The other way it could help is that we don't really fully understand risk. It's part of this business of how we get to people at a late stage. We get to them after they've made an attempt, which is not where you want to be here. Could we understand risk well enough to intervene before the attempt is made? We call that predict and preempt. Can we do that? And the question that comes up is whether there could be ways when people post public postings on Facebook that show that they're suicidal. Uh, potentially, if people had consented, would there be something that if they had made suicide attempts in the past where you could look at their search behavior and you'd be able to predict from search behavior that they were looking for means and be able to then reach back out to them. We have not done that, and we may not do that, but those are the opportunities that we should be thinking about at this point in time for what is a public health emergency. When you have that many deaths, almost all from treatable illnesses, we have to ask ourselves, how do we intervene better? How do we intervene earlier? And if technology can help with that, we should be thinking pretty seriously about what that would look like. As you've engaged in this process of really looking at technology, what do you see, you, you spoke about you know, 5, 10, 15 years from now, what do you see in the next generation? What do you see really down the road? Where do you, where do you envision the potential? So I'm quite hopeful. You know, when I think about the sort of revolutions of the last decade, genomic revolution, the neuroscience revolution, and this new tech revolution, I think those first two are going to be great, neuroscience and genomics, in 30 years. They will be the chemistry of the paint, and that's important to have safe paint. But in terms of putting out the fire, right now, I think technology has the most hope to really have an impact for people who are suffering in the next five years. So, Tom, thank you for all that you've done through the years in public service and all that you're doing now in private industry for our field, for our patients, for society. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you for joining me here today. My pleasure. Just as technology has had an impact on many areas of our lives, I believe that it offers great potential to improve mental health. Technology, including social media, can help monitor symptoms, provide early warnings if a person is developing an illness, and serve as a user-friendly, an easily accessible form of support and help 
for people with psychiatric conditions. And as I always emphasize, with help, there is hope. Until next time, I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein. Goodbye. Do not suffer in silence. With help, there is hope. Healthy Minds is brought to you in part by the American Psychiatric Association Foundation, the Graham Beck Foundation, and the New York State Office of Mental Health. If you would like to watch our expert interview in its entirety, log on to bbrfoundation.org slash healthyminds.